that this utopian thinking comes out of a long line of Greek philosophic reflections. There's a wonderful new translation of the Iliad by Stephen Williams, I believe. Just came out. We heard him speak the other day over on 86th Street at Barnes & Noble. And the Iliad is a, description, is a book by Homer, uh, published somewhere around 600. Nobody quite knows who Homer was, etc. Talks about the Trojan Wars. I'm sure you all know. And the Iliad is the first book that we have in which human emotions are fully expressed. Rage is the first word in the text. And it's no longer sort of uh, just an otherworldly, godly document or instruction of how to behave. It is a description of a true historic situation. Not necessarily historically true, but described as if it were a true history. It has all kinds of people going to battle from jealousy and anger and rage with uh, uh, blood and gore, uh, lively described description uh, in this book uh, where people are driven by historic circumstances, by the gods, by each other into the most abysmal, chaotic human situation. It is full of horror, full of revenge, uh, and the various God acting onto the lives of the various people leaves you, from our perspective, in admiration for the rich descriptions. But had you been in the midst of it, you would have experienced a total uh, agony of injustice, of having no rhyme, no reason for what happens, of having precisely the interplay between the visible human jealousies, you know, Paris had stolen Helena and Agamemnon goes out to revenge his brother Menelaus. And uh, they sit there in front of Troas and they go back and forth. And Achilles has his feelings hurt because the woman he had uh, taken as booty was uh, taken over by his military lord. And so he refuses to fight, etc., etc. It goes on and on. It's wonderful, but so bloody and so terrible. And you realize it's all the work of men and gods. And there's no order. There's no resolution. There's no, uh, nothing that remains of the human beings except what they finally hope to have done, and that is accomplish some kind of honor for themselves, not in life, but in death. Which rings a bell when we come back, it, or should ring a bell in about two weeks when we talk about the Nazi emphasis on honor in death. That death is the way to achieve honor, not life in the name of fascist ideology. Anyway, you have the Iliad, Homer's description of it. And of course, when Homer writes it four or 500 years after this, the, supposedly the Battle of Troy took place, he describes this utter chaos. And you understand why people worry about the absence of some kind of uh, explanatory framework, because it's so chaotic. You know, God's fighting against each other even. And God's contradicting themselves. And so is this the fundamental explanation of the world we live in? Is there nothing that is more stable? Remember the question I had when I went to law school. And indeed, the pre-Socratic pre -Socratic, uh, philosophers went through the Iliad and the, mystery, the myths of Greece and tried to find something that was more stable. And what they found, you're all familiar with it, I'm sure, are the four basic elements, air, land, water, and fire. And if you can explain everything in light of these four elements, which they tried to do in Asia Minor and the pre-Socratic philosophers, then you would have a framework of order, because then all the chaos would only be a temporary appearance, like it seems that way, but it all has a reason, founded in these elements. But of course, uh, you know, my criticism of it in part would be these elements are impersonal. They don't make love. They don't have compassion. They don't create, they just are. And thus it couldn't be the foundation of human existence or of justice and morality. The Greek dramatists played with the same ideas of how can we make sense of these things that people experience. Are they the fates that control us? Are these the gods? Life seems so contradictory and so absurd. And it's in that kind of a cultural philosophic framework that Plato, 
writes the Republic as well as many of the other dialogues, in pursuit of some kind of an order that would explain life. For, for Plato and Socrates <coughs> experienced the chaos uh, even more directly and immediately. <coughs> they lived in the 4th and 5th century before Christ, 5th and 4th century before Christ, and described the rise of the city-states in, in Greece, the rising power, and then the rivalry between, for instance, Sparta and Athens, and the wars they fought between each other, and uh, the attempts to set up a government in which uh, that would be more sane, more lawful, more consistent, and so forth. And they come up with a government of that we call democratic. Mind you, it wasn't democratic, because it was only the men who ruled. The women were excluded, the slaves were excluded. So it wasn't really democratic. It was just that all the men who could bear arms would vote. But left to themselves, without any outside source of reference, without any responsibility but to themselves, that democracy collapsed. It was just like the Weimar Republic in the 20s in Germany, where you had 13 different political parties, all pursuing different goals, and there was no possibility to create coalitions, to even have a semblance of working together for a common goal. And said, so, of course, the man of great order promises Adolf Hitler came in and said, uh, you know, I'll give you a charge, I'll give you a purpose, I'll restore your dignity in history, I'll give you an order. And as my father always said, he also gave nice clothes to all the soldiers, uniforms, which in the height of the Depression was, you know, something to be proud of because these were iron trousers rather than baggy pants. Anyway, that's what Plato had suffered through, and he saw the model of Sparta, and he saw Athens, and he said, the people left to themselves are no, give us no sanity. Democracy, just on the basis of people having the right to determine their own future, when you have that many people without an agreement, only creates chaos. They tried with a, the rule with a few oligarchs, that is, the ruling families of Athens, and they didn't do any better because each family was out to enrich themselves. And so Plato comes up with his dialogue in uh, The Republic, uh, 10 books of it, 10 sections of it, in which he basically deals with a question of what is the principle of order? What would regulate the Iliad confusion? What would regulate the democratic confusion? What would regulate the individual human oligarchic confusion that reigns in each person looking out only for himself? And he comes up with a proposition that is contained in this book called The 